All right, hello. Uh, welcome everyone to our latest ALTA Insights webinar. These are free presentations uh, we offer on issues important to title and settlement professionals. I'm Jeremy Yowie, also the Vice President of Communications, and today we've got a great webinar lined up to just get, discuss the latest cyber trends and provide tips to help you protect your business and your customers. Uh, this is definitely timely. Uh, last week, the FBI uh, released its uh, latest internet crime, crime report, and the speakers will be uh, providing some of the latest stats involving a business email compromise. Um, before starting, I do need to touch on a, a few housekeeping items. Uh, all participant lines are muted for today's discussion. If at any time you have a question, uh, submit them in the uh, questions box. We'll hold some time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded. Uh, recordings are for all of our webinars, including this one. Uh, you can always access on ALTA's website at alta.org forward slash webinars. Again, that's alta.org forward slash webinars. You also get an email with a link to the recording. Um, you can download a copy of today's presentation from the handout section. Uh, we've also uploaded a few other documents uh, that may uh, be helpful. You can find uh, ALCA's rapid response plan, as well as a worksheet that you can uh, use to document any wire fraud incidents. And uh, the speakers will be touching on these in the presentation as well. Um, it should be noted that today's webinar does offer CECLE credit for many states, um, only available to those attending the live presentation. And our platform does track attendance to meet uh, compliance for uh, different states. We'll have some poll questions during the webinar, monitoring that uh, your, your attention. So uh, no multitasking out there. And at the end of the presentation, I'll uh, post a link uh, so you can provide information uh, needed to uh, report your CE or CLE credit. Uh, any questions on that, send an email to education at alta.org. Uh, do need to thank Qualia for sponsoring today's Alta Insights presentation. And before introducing today's speakers, here's a short message from Qualia. Hi there, I am Debbie Brooks and I am the owner of Prominent Title along with my husband, Joe Brooks. And we are located in Cincinnati, Ohio, and we are open for business. My name is Bethany Payton. I'm the manager and majority owner of Total Title LLC, based in Indianapolis, Indiana, and we are open for business. Hi, my name is Sultana Hawk, and I'm the managing partner of Stone Ridge Title Group, the title company that services all of the state of Florida. We are open for business. My name is Ray Manuel. I'm the vice president of operations and sales for uh, National Title Solutions. So located in uh, Woodridge, Illinois, and we are open for business. We're not the medical field, but we are still doing something very important. And then that is still holding up this side of the economy. To be considered essential is a privilege. All right, uh, thank you, Qualia, for that message. Uh, now let me introduce today's speakers. Uh, join us today. Uh, we have the luxury to hear from two industry experts. Uh, both serve on ALCA's Information Security Work Group. Uh, first, we have Chris Hacker. Uh, Chris is co-founder and chief technical officer of ShortTrack. Uh, Chris is responsible for uh, platform development and oversees um, all legal concerns at ShortTrack. And uh, ShortTrack provides an online platform uh, that you can send and sign documents and, and do all that stuff online. Uh, also joining us is Andy White. Um, Andy is CEO of Closing, Closing Lock. Uh, Andy and his wife launched uh, the company to give title companies, realtors, lenders, consumers, basically everyone involved in the real estate transaction a, a secure way to send and receive wire instructions. So uh, thank you both for joining us today. That was a, a lot of uh, housekeeping and uh, stuff to cover. So. With that, Andy, I will turn it over to you as soon as I give you. There we go. All right. 
All right, thanks, Jeremy. So thanks for the introduction there. As Jeremy mentioned, my name is Andy White. I'm the CEO of Closing Lock. And today, Chris Hacker and I are gonna go through some cybersecurity stuff to hopefully protect you guys from becoming victims of fraud and protect your clients as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started here. If I can get this slide to go through, there we go. All right, some definitions and kind of goal of what we're doing today. We're going to be talking about cybersecurity. Cyber is just kind of a fancy word for uh, anything revolving around computers or information technology. The goal for the webinar today is that you guys get some tangible takeaways that you can use in your professional life and in your personal life uh, to protect you from the hack hackers and fraudsters out there trying to defraud everybody. We're not gonna get into like boring definitions or anything like that. That's the only slide where we're gonna do something silly like that stuff. So an outline of what we're gonna go over. We'll go over some general stats like Jeremy mentioned from the IC3, the latest report from the FBI on uh, what's going on in, in the cybersecurity world here. And then we'll talk about cybersecurity's impact on the real estate industry and how that affects you guys uh, specifically. And so kind of the format for what we're going to do is I'll kind of present um, the, the slides here and, and Chris is gonna hop in with, um, you know, kind of the color commentary here on, on what's going on with the slides and some uh, personal stories and some of the things they do with their business as it re relates to cybersecurity. All right, so some stats here. These are from um, the latest IC3 report. Uh, some of these are, some of these are from other places as well, but everyone is a target when it comes to cybersecurity, just because you work at a small business, large business, medium size, whatever, it doesn't really matter. Uh, hackers and fraudsters are going after everybody, regardless of what type of business or what size business you work at. In fact, a little over half of all malware attacks um, happen to small businesses. So just because you might think you're a small fish in a big pond, does not make you immune from hackers coming after you. Interestingly, about one in 13 requests today, web requests lead to malware. So when you're clicking around on the internet and you think about that, it's like, wow, that's a pretty crazy high number. Almost 8% of clicks that are going around on the internet are leading to malware or ransomware. So there's a lot of bad stuff out there. A lot of people are downloading bad things on a daily basis, even through the course of this webinar. Hard to say how many thousands or tens of thousands of um, copies of malware will be installed on different people's computer across the world here. So how does this happen? The most common way that these, um, these attacks happen is via email. And so we're gonna talk a lot about email and, and kind of how to protect your email account, how to protect your customers to make sure they're not becoming defrauded as well. And the IC3 estimated over the last five years, they have reports of over $6 billion in losses in the US alone just from email. So you can ignore everything else and say just through email account compromise, business email compromise, um, they have lost, uh, or they, us being people in the US have lost close to $6 billion in the last five years. So about half of the, or more than half of that, 3.6 billion of that 6 billion we just talked about has actually happened in the last two years. So business email compromise, uh, email account compromise there. That has happened in the last two years, over three and a half billion dollars of the six billion over the last five years, which that says this problem is growing every year. It's a huge problem. It's, it's coming in at close to two, tri or two billion dollars a year in the US over the last couple of years here. So it's a big problem. We need to be aware of it. We need to see some real tangible things we can do to protect ourselves from it. Uh, damage related to cybercrime is actually projected to hit to close to six trillion dollars by the end of 2021. That's all cybercrime. That's not just email or business email compromise, but all types of cybercrime across the, the world, uh, $6 trillion by the end of this year. Pretty crazy numbers there. It's, it's really kind of hard for us to uh, envision how big $6 trillion is. So what we're going to do is we're going to go over some cybersecurity tips, and uh, we're going to go over four different things that you guys can do to protect yourselves. And these should apply both to your professional life, so everything you're doing at work with your title company, but then also in your personal life as well. I'd like to provide tips that you guys can you know, take home with you. Everybody's working from home nowadays anyways, or a lot of people are. Um, and so I'd like to provide some tips that you, know, you can use while you're at home in your personal lives to also protect you, so not just professionally, but also personally there. One of the things that everyone always talks about is people are the weakest link. And so, uh, you know, we're going to talk about we're all people here. We're all using computers on a daily basis. So what can we do to protect ourselves? Let's make ourselves not the weakest link. Chris, yeah. do you have anyone out there about the cartoon? 
Yeah, everybody has you know, who's seen uh, prior presentations that I've been involved in, and you know, other people have used it as well. There's the cartoon, and if anybody's named Dave's on the call, I apologize, but uh, um, you know, it's the cartoon with the boxing ring, and on one corner you've got all the hardware, the security stuff, and the other corner you've got uh, Dave, and you know, Dave's the problem, right? Because the, we're the ones who don't follow rules or have the option not to follow rules. Um, we're the ones who can make bad decisions. You know, the computer and the hardware just does what it's what it's told. So, you know, just the key thing is, you know, it's all, it's all behavior at this point. You know, you can do everything you, you you're supposed to do and more with tech with hardware and technology, but if the people aren't using it, if they aren't using it right, uh, if they're circumventing it, it's all for naught. Yep, absolutely. And and so, you know, we need to make sure we're not the weakest link in this process here. And so that's why we're going to go over couple of tips today that can help us not be the weakest link. So number one, this one was really a lot more applicable before COVID happened because people were constantly going and working at coffee shops and, and libraries and wherever else that there was public Wi-Fi available, airports. Uh, that doesn't happen as much anymore, but probably in the near future we'll be out working again in public. And so when you connect to a public connection, like public Wi-Fi, for instance, it's very important that you understand that that connection is shared. Everybody else who is on that connection can see the data that you are sending through that network as well. And so if a you know sophisticated hacker or fraudster wants to go to Starbucks and hop on the public Wi-Fi there and start monitoring all the information that's going out of your machine, they have access to do that. And so one of the things I always like to talk about is a couple of ways to prevent that from happening. So if you are out somewhere and you're, you're mobile and you're trying to work there, there are a couple of different options you have for making sure you have a secure connection. One is VPN. Uh, there are a lot of different services out there, both um, personal services and business services for VPN. Large companies often have their own corporate VPN that you can connect to. Basically, that just creates a, a connection between you and the other end of the, the um, VPN there that is encrypted so that anyone who is on that shared channel with you, that public Wi-Fi, isn't able to see the communication that's going through that that network there. Just Another in case option, anybody hasn't seen already, you know, or see, heard it before, VPN stands for Virtual Private Network. So it's creating a, a private network that, you know, cuts you off from the public one that you're, you're connected to to get to the internet. Yep, that's a good point. And often VPNs are very affordable. I mean, we're talking like a handful of dollars a month you can get access to a VPN. I put Private Tunnel on here. I'm not endorsing Private Tunnel. It's just an example of a VPN service that's out there. Um, you can search Private Tunnel. You'll see all the competitors' ads will pop up as well. So there are a lot of different VPN services out there. It would be important to note, I, I probably wouldn't use a VPN service that's hosted overseas just because I'm a little paranoid about that. So if you find any that are you know, hosted in China or Russia, Maybe I'd stay away from that and pick a good US-based VPN service there if I was signing up for one. But another option that I really like is tethering. I, I kind of prefer that over VPN. And, and the concept of tethering is using your smart device, like your iPhone, for instance, as the Wi-Fi hotspot for whatever laptop or tablet or whatever you're trying to connect to the internet. So if you've got your laptop with you, your work laptop, and you're trying to connect, you can set up your, your smart device, your iPhone, to be a Wi-Fi hotspot that you can connect to and only you are connected to it, then it'll use your cell data for all the data communications there, which are encrypted, so you don't have to worry about uh, setting up a VPN or like that. And I put that it's free to use tethering, you know, there's the asterisk there because it is using the data on your phone service, so uh, you'd want to make sure data charges aren't going to get too high for you. If you're just sending emails and browsing websites, that shouldn't be a problem. And before we jump further, just the, you know, the other thing, probably want to avoid, the, there are free VPNs out there. Um, you don't want to use those because again, if you're not paying for it, how are they how are they making money, right? They're selling at least your browsing information, um, and you know there's no guarantee that and no recourse that they're actually encrypting your stuff when it hits their servers. So, you know, yeah, maybe. that's a good example. Yeah, you get what you pay for in that case. So update, the second tip that we're going to go over here today, software, we talked about people being the weakest link. Well, guess what? Software and hardware are developed by people. So they have problems, they have bugs. It's not intentional, but it happens all the time. And so these big tech companies out there, everyone who's making software releases patches and updates very regularly, and it is not difficult or cost you anything to install these updates. So it's very important to 
keep your browsers updated, keep your OS updated, any applications you're using, your phone. Apple releases iOS patches all the time that relate specifically to security updates. It's important to get those installed. You see the little Google Chrome up arrow in the top right corner, that means it's time to update. When it turns red, that means it's really time to update that you've got a security exploit that's active on your browser there. So it's important to keep those updated. Yeah, and, and most of the time, you know, those things, it's as simple as just restarting your browser, right? So, um, you know, if you just have a practice, I mean, I am I do this, I have it open constantly. I go to suspend suspend mode, I come back and, but I try to make make a point, you know, at least, you know, at least once a week, if not more frequently to, to close, exit the browser, restart it, and that I'm now I'm reusing the, the newer version if there was an update and I don't have to worry about it. The one other thing, you know, you know, is, and I know this is something that everybody deals with in this industry because there are sites that still require you to use it for it to function properly. But outside of, of things that require you to use Internet Explorer, you should not be using Internet Explorer, period, full stop. Uh, it is not being supported unless you have uh, some sort of, you know, security enterprise level agreement at the organizational level. And even then, it's just security patches. Um, you can't use a lot of the newer functionality. Uh, it just, you know, you should stop using Explorer. Edge, on the other hand, is the replacement, perfectly fine. Um, so uh, do what you can to migrate away from that as much as possible. Absolutely. I've drawn a little red X here on the Internet Explorer icon. These icons are a little outdated. Don't use the Internet Explorer one anymore. All right. Uh, it is poll question time to make sure everyone is uh, paying attention. So uh, please let us know if you've implemented a uh, solution to uh, help uh, safeguard against wire transfer fraud. Got about a third of the people who have voted. Give you a few more uh, seconds here. Looks like it's about an 80-20 split. 80% have, guys. 70% have voted. All right, we'll go ahead and close the poll here. All right. 78% said yes, they've implemented a uh, software uh, solution to prevent wire fraud, which means 22% have not. Excellent. Right. So uh, moving on here, we're going to talk about password managers. If you're not familiar with a password manager, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's just uh, some app or browser extension or, or program that you can use to store your passwords for you. So it's kind of like a vault for your password. You think, well, why would I ever want to just put all my passwords in one location? Well, there are multiple reasons for that. One is if you don't use some type of password manager, you're probably using the same or similar password on every site that you're accessing. And so when you're sharing passwords like that, it can be uh, very easy once a hacker gets into one of your accounts, now they have access to a lot or all of your accounts. So a password manager can help you to uh, create unique passwords for every single site. They'll create the password for you and they'll create a very strong password. So we'll use uppercase, lowercase, characters, all that thing, something you'll never have to remember because the password manager is gonna remember it for you. So it's not something you need to know. It, it's just something very uh, strong and complicated that the password manager keeps for you. These range from, there are free ones out there. This isn't a, uh, you get what you pay for. There's some good ones that are actually free out there. And then um, some of them charge for their service as well, or some of them have additional features. And a couple of the examples here, LastPass and 1Password. Again, I'm not endorsing those. I'm just trying to give some examples out there of, of password managers that you can use. Yeah, and the, the I mean, we use LastPass, you know, uh, for, with our comp our company, um, you know, we there is a free version of it, uh, you know, for personal usage. Uh, you know, you want to use it across multiple devices. I think right, so for personal usage, then there's a fee, um, a nominal fee, and then there's a higher fee, a slightly higher fee, but still nominal for the business usage. And part of the upside of the business usage is that it provides you with a um, administrative panel. And there's fee the other services have stuff like this as well. Um, that lets you as the administrator go in and look and see, not see the passwords, but see the strength of the passwords that people are using. Are they using it properly? Have they updated them recently? Um, you know, some of them even provide services to like check, is this password been compromised? You know, is it one of the ones that's out available on the dark web? Um, so, so there's, you know, additional benefits from an organizational perspective. And, you know, it ends up being, I think like, you know, 20, 20 bucks a user per year or something like that on average. Uh, give or take. So it's a pretty nominal uh, cost for 
um, having all of your passwords be strong and encrypted and you know visible as far as policy but not the passwords themselves and shareable without having to expose the actual password so lots of benefits to it um, uh, if you're not using one now you should be and you know it's a very simple thing that you could you could do today um, you know with your employees yep absolutely so multi-factor authentication that's going to be our next little topic that we hit on here that's a fancy way of saying that you're using multiple things for logging into some system and, and those multiple things can be any of uh, something that's uh, something you know something you possess or something that you inherently have so knowledge being like a password for instance uh, possession could be a, a hardware device like a, a cell phone, for instance, you get a text message sent to your cell phone. Inherence is something that you inherently have or are, for instance, um, like an iris scan or a fingerprint or something like that. So whenever you combine those things together, you are creating multi-factor authentication, so multiple factors of authentication. And we'll go through some real world examples of what that fancy word means. And we'll talk about two-factor authentication. So in this case, we're just talking about two different types of um, things for authenticating here. In this particular example that we're looking at, um, the two-factor authentication was done via password and a text message or password and a phone call that's sent to your phone. And so, you know, you type in your password to log in then you get some six or eight digit code texted to you and you type that in. And so we're able to do multi-factor authentication or two-factor authentication in that case via the password and the text message there to your phone. Most of the time, this, this type of additional authentication, two-factor authentication, is free from whatever service is providing it for you. So, you know, if you go to log into your bank, you can enable two-factor authentication. The bank will provide that ability to do the two-factor authentication free of charge to you. So there's not really a good reason to not do it because it's not going to cost you anything. Another type of two-factor authentication here is um, software tokens. And so in this case, uh, we've got an app and the one that we, we've labeled here is just Authy. That's a, a common app for storing uh, two-factor authentication codes on your phone. And so this is an app like on iOS or Android there. And so you can do two-factor authentication with a password and then some code that is generated by this app on your phone. And so that's a nice feature as well. So it's not using your cell phone, you know, it's not using your phone number per se, it's just using an app on your cell phone. You type in that code whenever you log in there. As you can tell, um, this, this sample screenshot here has got, you know, uh, two-factor authentication with a software token for multiple accounts, Facebook, Amazon, LastPass, Gmail, Dropbox, Outlook, everything. So you can really lock down just about all of your accounts now with multi-factor authentication whether you do that through your cell phone, whether you do it through an app, uh, whether you do it through some little hardware token, it's um, all important. Whichever one you can do, make sure to take advantage of it there. I don't remember what the next slide, are we still talking about the, because I wanted to throw in the thing about that Jeremy brought up um, before the call about the password list. Um, yeah, no, go ahead and, and, and do that now. And sure. the next slide we'll talk about layering. Great. Um, so, uh, you know, another version of, you know, because again, it's just multiple factors, right? There's nothing, uh, password is not a requirement for multiple factors. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there, you know, people have been hankering for and people are starting to deliver. In fact, both both of our products, um, you know, deal with, uh, you know, have password passwordless access under certain circumstances. Um, and the way that's done is you're using a different factor other than the password. So, um, you know, in our in our case, you know, it's, we know it's coming from your, uh, the fact that something that you are, it's coming from your title production software. We know it's coming from your title production software. It's identifying it as you. Um, we're able to validate that. Um, that's something that the inherence. And then there's some other um, you know, token you know, that's passed along with it to identify something more detailed. And we can use that to say, this is this person from that organization. And here you go, you're, you're in, a, in a session. And that session may or may not be limited to a certain set of features, but there's ways to now do that that don't require your users um, in those kinds of middleware situations to need a password. Yeah, absolutely. Passwordless authentication, like like Chris was saying there, that they use it, we use it for our customers logging in as well. It's a very cool feature, uh, very easy to use from you or your client's perspective, makes it uh, very simple, especially for one-time transactions, which real estate transactions often are here. All right, so lastly on tips before we kind of talk about wire fraud in real estate here. So lastly on our cybersecurity tips is layering. 
obviously there's no silver bullet. If, if there was one thing I could tell you to go do and that would fix all your cybersecurity problems, then this would have been a really short webinar and probably wouldn't be needed because everybody would already be doing that. So there's not just one, one solution fits everything and you're done. You really need to be layering these approaches. And what does that mean? That means making sure your connection is secure, making sure you're keeping everything updated. Use a password manager so you have strong passwords, um, secure passwords. They're all stored somewhere easy for you to access. And then lastly, combine that with two-factor authentication. So what I'm showing here is actually uh, a screenshot from my phone with uh, LastPass. So we use LastPass for our password manager as well. And this is the multi-factor authentication to access our password manager. So when I was talking about password managers earlier, you might have thought to yourself, hey, Andy, this doesn't seem like a very good idea to store all of my passwords in one location, right? What if a hacker gets into my LastPass account? Then I'm going to be in a lot of trouble here. So the way we handle that uh, internally here is actually I've got a, a password for my password manager. So you do have to have one password for your password manager. It's called your master password. And you make that something very, very complicated and difficult so nobody's ever going to be able to guess it. And in my case, I actually took it, wrote it down on a piece of paper and put it in the safe in my closet at home. So in order to get access to my last pass account, you need to break into my house, get into the closet, get into the safe, pull out the piece of paper, understand that that random password written on a piece of paper actually goes to my LastPass account, then log into my LastPass account. And even then, I've got my password manager, my LastPass account locked down with multi-factor authentication. So you would still need my cell phone so you could get the little code off of the app in order to access the password manager. So it's a whole lot of steps for somebody who is a fraudster or hacker to get access to the password manager. From my perspective, I've got the password manager. I've logged into it on my computer, so I have access to all my passwords there. I've got the multi-factor on my phone. So it's very easy from my perspective, very difficult from a hacker to, to do. All right, so let's talk about cybersecurity and why it matters for you in the real estate industry. Obviously, number one on this list is wire fraud. Everybody's very familiar with that and why that's important because either your company's losing money or your clients are losing money. And so cybersecurity impact on real estate basically boils down to wire fraud. There's another smaller issue there as well with the personally identifiable information. Obviously on a real estate transaction, a lot of sensitive information is being sent around often via email. So it's important for you guys to have your cyber house in order in order to protect everybody's PII and of course protect their money from wire fraud here. I've got a, a personal story on wire fraud. When I worked as a computer engineer formerly at Samsung, um, former colleague of mine there, she and her husband were buying their first house and she sent $20,000. She was a computer engineer and very smart, smart lady, um, very cyber aware and uh, very familiar with computers. She got an email from a, a fraudster didn't realize it was fake wiring instructions. Her and her husband wired off $20,000 to the wrong account. Uh, they didn't realize it for several days. So by the time they, they got around to talking with the title company again, the money was definitely gone. And of course, they didn't bother reporting it to the FBI because at that point, money was already gone. They weren't going to be able to get it back. So what's the point even trying there? I think, Chris, you had a story too about somebody with wire fraud. Yeah. I mean, I you know, we were trading stories when we were getting ready for this and we, we both have um, you know heard uh, from customers or uh, people in the industry about you know how they or someone they know you know like especially the the mid-sized to smaller size operations you know one, one company I know of had a million dollar loss um, that you know was potentially attributable attributable in part to them um, and as a result of that they don't exist anymore um, I mean so you know the Everybody knows that nobody likes to think about it, but you know this can be an existential issue. Um, and even when it's not existential, it's extreme can be extremely costly because even if you did everything right, even if you didn't, you know, you got all the waivers and you followed all the steps and all of that, you're still one of the deep pockets from the consumer's perspective. You've got an insurance policy from their perspective, and they're going to sue you. Um, and you know there's going to be cost around that. And so even though you know, you may not ultimately get left holding the bag, you still had to play the game. Uh, and, you know, that's costly both monetarily, you know, uh, reputationally and, you know, time. So it's important yep. to try and protect them from themselves. Um, 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, you might be thinking, well, this hasn't happened to me yet. And just because it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean it won't. So it's good to take this stuff seriously. And, you know, we're not trying to say all this to, to scare people or anything. We just want you all to be aware of what's going on. And it really does happen every day to real nice, normal people. So it's important well, to kind of be prepared. Yeah, and the standards are changing, right? So, you know, four years ago, this was a, you know, not a new thing, but it was a new thing that was becoming sort of broadly, people becoming broadly aware of. And that was more of a particular kind, you know, the um, outbound wire fraud. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the changes that have happened. But now that everybody knows about it, you know, back then, if you weren't doing a bunch of things, it was, you know, reasonable that maybe you didn't know about it. Um, now it's not. And if you're still not doing anything about it, you know, you make, you know, find out, you know, self in a lawsuit caught with your pants down because, you know, the expectation is that you should have done something about it now. Whereas, you know, five years ago, that wasn't the expectation. Yeah, absolutely. And the fact that you're on this call, you know, as Chris mentioned earlier, um, when we were talking, preparing, you've kind of self-selected yourselves as people that are interested in protecting themselves and, and their customers from wire fraud. So that's good. Just being here is the good first step. And so hopefully you learned something from the uh, the webinar here that you can take away. And, and so you or your customers won't be victims of wire fraud. So a couple of scary stats here that we'll talk about. About $2 billion was lost from business email compromise. We talked about that at the beginning of the uh, webinar here. And that's just in the U.S. alone. And that includes, you know, anytime your title company sends money to the wrong spot. So if a fraudster gets fake wiring instructions over to you guys and you guys send your money to the wrong spot, whether you're trying to pay off a loan or send out proceeds or whatever, that would kind of fall under the BEC column here because you as a business would have a business email compromise if the instructions were via email there. Your number would fall somewhere in that $2 billion amounted there. On the other side of the transaction, if your buyers are trying to send money to you, for instance, and they lose their money because they send it to the wrong place, then that's the number on the right there, the $213 million reported losses um, in the real estate world. So that's from the consumer's perspective. The other side's from the business's perspective. At the very bottom, you see uh, an asterisk here for the estimates, 10 to 15% of the losses are actually reported. So when we say $200 million is lost in the U.S. from real estate, the FBI is estimating that might only be 10 to 15% of the actual number there. So you're talking upwards of maybe $2 billion. It's a daily thing. People lose their money every day to wire fraud in a real estate transaction. So it's important uh, that we understand why and how we can prevent that. One of the fun things I always like to point out, this is from the IC3 annual report last year from uh, the FBI 2020 numbers. So these are very fresh, just like a week old, I think that they had this released here, is the victims by age group. So these are all the victim or all the um, um, crimes they have reported. This is not specific, just the wire fraud here, but this is all the, the crimes they have reported. And you can see the victim count and everyone always thinks, oh, well, it's, you know, the elderly people are the ones who aren't familiar with computers and technology. They're the ones who are becoming victimized and, and falling prey to these hackers and fraudsters. But then when you actually look at the numbers here, you see that all of the buckets are not that different. I mean, we're talking age range 40 to 49 there, 91,000 people. Over 60 is a huge bucket. There are a lot of people that fall in the category of just over 60 years old. In fact, a lot more than just fall into the category of 50 to 59. And there are only 105,000 victims in that, that range. So um, it's not just old people that are becoming victims of fraud. It, it's everybody. So just because you've got some millennial home buyer and you think, oh, they'll, they'll know about wire fraud. I don't have to worry about that with them. They're, they're tech savvy. I don't need to worry about them getting defrauded. That is not the case. Everybody is a potential target and everybody is a potential victim, unfortunately. And you can actually see the, the numbers here on the far right. The total loss increases as the buckets go up. It's not that there are more victims, it's just that those people have more money. So somebody who's in their 50s and becomes victims, they probably lose more money than somebody who's in their 20s just because they had more money in the transaction going on. There. So I always think that's really surprising and interesting that it's not just older people that are losing their money to these scams. All right, so wire fraud here, we've got a couple of different types of wire fraud. I don't know why our arrows have some weird graphics in the middle of them there, but that's not really important. We're going to talk about outbound wire fraud, outbound meaning from your title company's perspective. So you guys sending money out somewhere outbound and then inbound money coming into you guys from your customers, for example, like a buyer. Uh, one interesting thing I found when I've done some research on this topic before is there's a, a group out there called the Business Trial Group. 
And they have a blog post that if you search for wire fraud in real estate, it comes up pretty prominently there and you read through it and it talks about wire fraud. And they are a contingency basis attorney group. So they are actively seeking and marketing and advertising toward people who lost money in a real estate transaction. So home buyers, for instance, sent their money to the wrong spot. This business trial group is out there looking for people that that has happened to. They'll represent them on a contingency basis. So no cost for the buyer. And then they'll come after you. They'll come after the title company, the escrow company, the real estate agent, everybody in the process. So there are groups out there that are actively looking to sue you if they're if a, a home buyer loses their money. So it's important to talk about kind of both sides of the transaction. Yeah. And, you know, as an attorney, I'll say this, um, you know, this is the the wire fraud equivalent of an ambulance chaser. Um, you know, so uh, these are people who are looking to, you know, get a quick settlement, um, you know, get some money, extract money from you for the mistake of somebody else. In some cases, maybe you did something wrong, but, you know, uh, just like with an ambulance chaser, maybe they, maybe they did something, you know, the, the person was actually a victim of something as opposed to, you know, an a it was truly an accident, but you know, it doesn't matter. They're just trying to squeeze, squeeze, uh, you know, some dollars out of you. So, uh, again, not to scare, but like it's, you need to be taking it seriously because these people are, uh, so. Yep. So let's see what we can do, uh, both on the outbound and the inbound side. I'm going to go fairly quickly through the outbound. Um, you guys have mostly figured out some pretty good processes and policies that you've got in place to protect you from losing your money. So we're not going to hammer on that too much. But obviously, you know, education, it, all of your agents and, and everybody in your agency needs to know about outbound wire fraud and why it's an actual real problem. But protecting your email, like we talked about, use a password manager for your email. Um, account, make sure you've got two-factor authentication enabled for your email account. The last thing you want is a fraudster sending an email from your account to your buyer with fraudulent wiring instructions or sending emails um, you know, to other people in your company telling them to send money out to this, this fraudulent account there. And then, of course, if you can do it in person, require the wire info in person. couple of other things, phone calls, make sure you're calling people. It doesn't take very long. If you're about to wire out a bunch of money, call them, make sure it's the right person, make sure it's a legitimate phone number. Don't just call a random phone number. You get an email, make sure it's the actual contact information for your clients that you're trying to send money to. Verify the bank account. There are different services out there. We even offer some bank account verification services as well that can make sure that the account number routing number are legitimate accounts. They can even sometimes tell you the account owner's name on that account to make sure you're sending your money to the right spot. And then lastly, very reactive, make sure you have an insurance policy. I talked to a title company yesterday, a uh, large title company, and they just um, had their insurance carrier drop them because they have had too many wire fraud losses um, reported. So they've had too many claims and they've now been dropped from their insurance that would uh, cover them for outbound wire fraud. So the insurance policy should be a very reactive step. Preferably you prevent it from ever happening in the first place, but insurance can be a good backup. And as the insurance world has tightened up like crazy, I talked to somebody from Lloyd's of London a couple of days ago. He was telling me that uh, the underwriters are uh, very, very particular with what they're writing policies on now. So um, they are less and less interested in protecting this type of fraud because it's costing them a lot of money. So premiums are going through the roof. This guy actually said 40 to 60 percent premium increases he's seen uh, since COVID has broken out with some of the, the wire fraud losses there. So anyways, make sure if you can get an insurance policy to protect against that, that's a good thing to have. As an analogy, this is the same sort of behavior that uh, we saw, you know, 10, 15 years ago when uh, the you know insurance homeowners insurance you know companies started going you know you've had you've had two claims in the last two years uh, you're out um, you know obviously it's a different scale but you know that's what we're we're entering that space again so if you remember how disruptive that was as a as a homeowner um, or you know to the to the industry as a whole you know this is going to be you know just as uh, big a change you know, on that regard yep absolutely. So if you have a change to wiring instructions, you, you can kind of build out, I, I put together a little pie chart here, but it, it just has a lot of questions on it. And you could even make yourself like a decision tree. The company could make one on, you know, kind of how to handle these different steps. And, you know, just make sure that 
why are they changing wiring instructions to begin with? That's a very good question. If they don't have a good reason, then I'm not sure you should let them actually change it. Can you get the new ones in person? Does it have to be a wire transfer? Is it urgent? Fraudsters love to fray on that. Oh, this is urgent. You need to send out this wire in the next hour. Or I'm going to sue you because you're holding on to my money, whatever. Um, all these kind of questions you need to just kind of raise whenever something happens and there's a change to your wiring instructions. Did they call you? Did they email you? Or did you call them? Did you use legitimate contact information when you were talking to them? You know, if you're just doing an email, be very skeptical of that. So just try to understand why and put together maybe a list of things you can do um, for having a, a change to wire instructions policy at your company. Yeah, two things to you know emphasize. You know, tying it back to we were talking about multi-factor authentication, you want to have multi-channel communication, right? You know, like uh, but to his, you know, to uh, Andy's point, you know. If they're emailing you, get on the phone. If they called you, call them back um, at the number you already had, right? You know, those sorts of things. I mean, these are all things that you know. And the second thing is, you know, really to one of the things to work on with your staff in terms of training is to try to inoculate them from the uh, being pressed, like, because they're going to try and up the anxiety, uh, the fraudsters will, up the, you know, the pressure, the urgency, and have somebody react to that rather than thinking. So the, the more you can prep your people to, to expect that, um, and not to react to it as much as possible, um, the more likely you are to not have the mistake be made. Yep, absolutely. So shifting now to inbound wire fraud, you know, the, the title industry has done a pretty good job about not losing their own money, which is very good. So protecting against outbound wire fraud. On the inbound side, buyers seem to still be losing their money at the same pace they have been, or maybe even an increasing increased pace over the last year or so. So why is that happening? Well, hackers are lazy. They, they are like good programmers. Good programmers are lazy also because they find the easiest solution to the problem. And so that's what makes them good. They're, they're fast at getting the job done there. Hackers are the same way. They want the easiest way to make money. If it's going to be very difficult and complicated for them to do it, they're going to move on to something else that's a lot easier for them to do. Why is inbound wire fraud so easy for a hacker? Well, one, one obvious reason is we've got about 6 million home buyers a year in the US every year, and about a third of those are first-time home buyers. So about 2 million people every year come into the market to buy a house and have never done it before and know nothing about the process and know nothing about real estate wire fraud. And so it's important, and, and even the people that are existing home buyers that have purchased homes before, the, the 4 million there, um, they've actually probably been in their home for about 7 to 10 years when wire fraud wasn't really a problem when they bought their home 7 to 10 years ago, so they don't know about it either. So a lot of different reasons why uh, inbound wire fraud is becoming a, a worse and worse problem here. So one real quick thing on this slide is, um, you know, everybody knows buying, closing a real estate transaction is very chaotic and stressful. There are a million different things going on at once. Scaring your customers about wire fraud is just another thing that will decrease their satis satisfaction with, a, with the home buying process there. So, you know, I, I don't want to scare your customers about wire fraud. I don't want you to scare them. I, I just want you to educate them and make them know that it's a real thing. It's not something that just happens abstractly and, oh, it's $2 billion or $200 million or whatever the number is. And such a big number, I don't care. It's not going to happen to me. They need to be aware that it could happen to them. And one of the big problems is about 75% of people think that the bank or the title company can recover their wired funds for them. Now, the FBI has got some recovery asset teams that uh, have had some decent success recently. They even quote numbers of like 80%. They quote 80% of a much smaller number than the, the total pie of amount lost there. So I don't think they're recovering 80% of all the funds that are being sent out. But a lot of people think that a wire can be reversed because you guys know how it is with your credit cards. If somebody steals your credit card number, you call up the bank, they say, oh, we're so sorry, Mr. White, we'll get that new credit card sent right to you and we'll get those charges removed from your account. A lot of consumers have that same mentality when it comes to sending a wire transfer of, oh, well, I, I messed up, I'll just call up Wells Fargo and get my money back. And as we all know, it doesn't work that way. So some myths about protecting against uh, inbound wire fraud. We, Chris and I both have heard these quite a few times from a lot of different people. Um, so our goal is to hopefully kind of, uh, you know, let you be aware that that these are myths and, and they're not actually doing anything to protect uh, the buyers. And, and one of those is encrypted email. I hear all the time, oh, we use encrypted email. So that, that keeps us safe. 
Well, it keeps the content of the email safe, but it doesn't prevent a fraudster or a hacker from sending their own email, maybe even their own encrypted email that looks like it's from your title company that has new set of wiring instructions in it. So just because it's encrypted doesn't mean it's doing anything to actually protect the recipient there. A um, couple of other things, warnings and email signatures. Nobody reads the warnings in the email signatures. I'm sorry to, to break that news to you, but it just doesn't happen. I talked with somebody at a, uh, uh, a chief training officer at a big insurance underwriter recently, and she had changed in her email subject line to say, um, if you read this email subject line or, or uh, um, footer email signature line down there, then I will send you a $100 Amazon gift card. And out of the thousands of people she sent it to in the company, she had like two or three people actually read it and reply to her and, and claim their Amazon gift card there. So unfortunately, nobody's reading those warnings. Phone number, yeah, you put your phone number in your email and your wiring instructions, great. A fraudster will do the same thing and they'll just put in their own information there. Same thing with a logo. A fraudster will get your logo off your website and put it in their own wiring instructions and send the exact same thing. Yeah, so I mean, all of that's to say, like, you know, the, it's not that you shouldn't put the warning in your email signature. You should, um, and just as a CYA, but, you know, it's not going to stop it, you know, is the point. Um, same thing with, you know, branding your instructions. That, Sure. You know, again, the, the name of the game here is make it a little bit harder, right? Um, so if you've done done these things, you're making it a little bit harder. But the, you know, in the encrypted email side of things, you know, the the way, you know, if you've heard me talk about it before, you've heard this, but we, you know, we finally, like, how do we conceptualize this with something we know um, and we're familiar with? And, you know, the encrypted emails like FedEx, right? You have a, you have a message, you've got some information, you put it in an envelope, you seal it, and you turn it over to them, and it's secure. Uh, it's secure from the Dropbox to the, you know, to the truck or airplane to the truck to your doorstep. But then they leave it on your doorstep or your foyer. Um, and anybody who has access to that doorstep or foyer now has access to that information. And your inbox is the same, you know, is the same way. Um, you know, it's only secure to the extent your password's secure. And if you've given it up some other way, then there's nothing, you know, that encrypted email isn't going to do anything. Um, they have access to your inbox. Oh, well, I don't, I bet we've had people say, well, I don't, I don't actually attach the stuff. They have to come into the portal. Right. Well, how do they reset the password? They go and say, reset my password. I'll verify my email, but I have access to the email. And so I'm just going to reset the password. Um, so there's, there's, you know, it doesn't, again, not, not saying don't use it, right? Because it does provide some layer of protection but it's not a cure-all by any stretch. Absolutely, that, that's a, a great way to put it. Encrypted email is great. Yeah, I didn't mean to make it sound like we shouldn't be using encrypted email, but uh, it's not gonna prevent fake wiring instructions being sent to your buyers. All right, so another thing you can do, and we've had great success with this. You know, obviously education um, is very important, educating your buyers about it and protecting email accounts like we just talked about and multi-factor authentication as well. But the agreements and waivers, and this kind of falls under the education category as well. Um, one thing we've had great success with is this wire fraud notice when, when the buyer goes to log into our site to get their wiring information. They have to agree to this notice that says, I'm not going to use other wiring instructions. I acknowledge that wire fraud is a real thing, and I'm not going to trust any wiring instructions I get in an email. So if a fraudster does send a fake email or a, a email with fake wiring instructions in it, buyer says, wait a minute, I wasn't supposed to receive any wiring instructions via email. Anytime you can cut out email, that's a pretty good, pretty good option there. And then, you know, they'll make sure to call you to verify these. So this, this notice serves two purposes. One, it helps add to the education level because, um, you know, people will skim over it before they actually click accept there. So they're thinking, okay, good. I've got a little more education with me. And then two, uh, an agreement or a waiver like this, sometimes it's required by your insurance policy, but even if it's not required, it can be good from a CYA perspective from your title company because now you've got proof that your buyer saw this, was aware of wire fraud, and, and agreed that you know they weren't going to be victims of it. So it provides you a little protection as well. So anytime you can get an agreement or waiver in there, that, that's helpful. All right, so protecting against inbound wire fraud again. Chris mentioned a, a minute ago about multi-channel. So send an email, send a text message, send a phone call. If you've got their contact information, why aren't you using it? I mean, if they're calling you, send them an email. Make sure it's actually them that was calling you. Use all the channels you have available to you and avoid sending any instructions via email. Soon as you put your wiring instructions in an email, whether it's encrypted or not, fraudster's gonna send fake 
wiring instructions or fraudulent wiring instructions via an email to your customer as well. So just tell your customers, we're never going to email it to you. There are a lot of different ways you can get it to them that don't involve email. That's a great option there. Multi-target, about three quarters of buyers are couples. Um, and so usually, often, you have the contact information for the multiple people on, who are buying that, that piece of property there. So if you've got three quarters of them being couples, make sure you're reaching out to both sides of the, um, the buyer side there. So make sure, you know, if it's a husband and wife, for instance, make sure you're communicating with the husband and the wife. And, and tell them, hey, we're not going to send you wiring instructions via emails. Tell both of them that. And so if one of them gets the wiring instructions, they say, hey, wait a minute, that's that's not right. Uh, KISS, and I'm not talking about the band down here. This is the acronym of Keep It Simple Stupid that came out of the military, I think, in the 60s. Anytime you try to complicate something, it is going to fall apart. And nobody is going to use it. So keep it as simple as possible. Whatever method you choose, however you choose to communicate with your uh, buyers on on wire fraud and, and the wiring instructions there, make sure it is simple. If it's complicated for you and your company, your employees aren't going to want to use it. If it's complicated for the buyer, they're not going to use it. If you make the buyer jump through a bunch of hoops to get their wiring instructions, they're going to say, forget you, just email them to me. Why are you making this so difficult? And so you got to keep it simple on all sides of the transaction there. The last one there is completely tug in cheek. I heard this at the NS3 conference several years ago. A title company owner said, I don't care. It's not my money. Obviously, that is a terrible solution. Don't do that one. That one's completely ridiculous. Um, that guy probably is not still in business with that type of attitude. So uh, it is a problem. You want to make sure your customers are aware of it and you want to keep it simple for them. All right. Jeremy, we've got another poll question here. All right. Yeah, I was uh, responding to an email, an urgent email that I got to review some uh, closing documents so i was opening the attachments is that a bad thing <laughs> yeah that might be a bad idea <laughs> okay all right I, I closed it really quick so hopefully nothing happened anyway just kidding all right here here's our second poll question uh do you have a wire fraud re response plan I'll give you guys a few uh 10 seconds or so to answer this poll question we'll get back to the content here we've got about a little less than 10 minutes to go if you guys All have right. questions that you've been sitting on, you know, uh, you want to ask, go ahead and start. Yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah, great, great, uh, great timing for that. So a couple of questions that came in about um, VPN and public Wi-Fi. Uh, the first one, public Wi-Fi. If you're on it and, you know, the hackers, can they only see what you're doing at what you're doing at that moment in time? Or if they're if you're in the public Wi-Fi and they get access where they can they install some software that can follow you afterward depends on your yeah it's a great great question um, I'll, I'll take first depends on what your what how your settings are set up and what and how sophisticated they are um, they can sniff the packets that are being passed over the network that's you know that's only while you're connected to that network but it's also possible that they could try and you know if you don't have their latest up, updates on your machine that they could break through your firewall if you're even running one um, you know, most people have a Mondo by default, Microsoft comes with them, et cetera, but they can break through your firewall and install something, which would then let them monitor you later. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's, that's a really good question. And, and that's why it kind of gets back to the layering that we talked about. So as Chris mentioned, he hit the nail on the head there. If you're not updating, if you're not updating your browser, for instance, there are active exploits that people know about in order to attack your browser if you have an outdated browser. You have an outdated operating system, outdated iOS, outdated whatever application you're using. As soon as you put that on a network where other people can see your computer, they can exploit those, those holes that you have in your system there. So, um, and like Chris pointed out, putting a network sniffer or a packet sniffer on a, a hacker, that's a very trivial thing to do. Uh, they can install that. They can sit there and watch all of your communications that go on through that public Wi-Fi. So it's important to layer those things together. Yeah, good stuff. When you guys talking about the tethering, uh, pre-COVID when we were traveling in airports, I, I would often, you know, connect, you know, for a hotspot on my phone. Um, obviously, a good point to know about your data plan. Uh, but also now, you know, doing it because I can't go in a facility and I'm waiting in my car for my kids' activities to wrap up. So you take the laptop, you do some work while you're sitting there waiting for an hour and a half or whatever. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I, I haven't connected to a public Wi-Fi network in probably five or six years. To, you know intentionally yeah um, yeah uh, 
we are getting a, a few more a few more questions popping in. So why don't we get back to the, we have a few more slides and we we'll transition back to questions. Yeah, so we've just got two, uh, left. Go ahead, yeah, two slides here. So we've got our wire fraud response plan. Alta has done a great job of putting together some, some information for us. Always tell the FBI, even regardless of the amount, it's good for them to know how much money is being lost because legislators look at this data to decide how much effort they should put into trying to prevent this problem. So the more the FBI knows about it, the more they can help. They actually have some, some utilities on their side too that can recover assets. Sometimes they have a thing called the financial fraud kill chain that they can employ. And so sometimes they can get the money back. It's always good to talk with them as soon as possible. But the the links there, I put inspect links for clicking. Never just click random links, even if it's from somebody claiming to be a cybersecurity expert. Uh, don't trust anybody, be very paranoid. Uh, but Jeremy's put the uh, the material there, the response plan and the worksheet um, as one of the handouts on the meeting here. So it's great to download those because if you lose money, if your client loses money, it is DEF CON 1 immediately, alarm bells are going off, sirens are going off. It is full on panic mode at that point to get the money back as quickly as possible. And so you wanna make sure you have a plan in place and you wanna make sure you have a worksheet so it's really simple to follow and, and go along with there. Right, paint by numbers because you're not gonna be thinking. Yeah, and, and I'd add, you know, as more states look at this, you know, you have New York with their cybersecurity regulation and there was a, um, a lender, uh, I think earlier this month, who settled a $1.5 million fine, you know, because data was accessed through a phishing scheme. Uh, so you definitely want to have policies and procedures in place. Uh, our last poll showed 18% of the people on the call don't have a plan in place. So I would uh, definitely start looking into this. Absolutely. All right. So the last uh, last slide here is our shameless plug of our companies. Obviously, I work at Closing Lock. Uh, we are wire fraud prevention solutions. So we provide uh, wire fraud prevention for all aspects that are going on there, inbound fraud, outbound fraud even payoff verification fraud. We can tell you whether the account number is legitimate or not before you go to send all your money there. I am Andy White, that's my email address there. Please reach out to me if you have any questions, you wanna talk about wire fraud. Even if you just want me to review your current company's policies regarding wire fraud, I'm happy to do that. Even if you don't wanna sign up for our service because you've got a different system that you're already happy with and you just wanna go over everything you're doing, make sure it's sound and secure, please reach out, contact me. I'll be glad to talk with you about it. And I'm, you know, with Short Track, and you know, our the things we're known for is uh, our easy orders, which the original digital title order. That's uh, being able to have realtors from their software, like Dot Loop, DocuSign Rooms, uh, SkySlope, be able to submit, you know, an order to you electronically and have it show up in your title production software as a new order, complete with data and documents. We've got our Easy Docs, which is, you know, digitizing your in intake sheets and other forms where you're collecting information and signatures and having that be something that they can, can complete you know, on a browser or on their phone. Uh, and then we have uh, the integration with DocuSign that lets you stay in your software, but use DocuSign. So um, that's, uh, that's my email, uh, that's our website. Um, any of that uh, is interesting to you, uh, please do reach out. And I'm sure you've, you've heard from and will continue to hear from uh, my partner, Steve. So uh, with that, you know, I know we're at time, but uh, happy to answer any questions. Yeah, Andy, Chris, thanks for the, all the, the great information. A lot of uh, real tangible type of security tips people can implement as soon as we jump off this call. Uh, we'll, we do want to get back to some of the questions you guys submitted. I know we're at the top of the hour. Maybe we'll take five minutes. If we don't get to them, again, their contact information is on the previous slide, so please feel free to uh, reach out to either Chris or Andy. Um, another question on uh, VPN. Um, Lance asked, how do you verify that a US-based paid commercial VPN is trustworthy? Is, is there a Yelp out there? <laughs> uh, yeah, go for it. Uh, is there a Yelp out there? No, um, but you know, it's uh, the way we've done it, you know, sort of ask around, um, you know, there's, you can look around, you know, in terms of people talking about it, there's all sorts of, of articles, you know, out there from reputable, uh, you know, news sources, technical news sources as well, Wired and, you know, things like that. Um, I mean, really what you're interested in besides, you know, are they a known quantity is, you know, who are they, where are they, what's their brand? Um, the one, you know, the one exception that I've made on our side with the US-based only is, 
um, Proton. Um, they uh, have an encrypted everything um, you know, service, you know, but both VPN and email, um, and you know that's their whole shtick, right? Um, so, you know, for what we're, you know, uh, when I'm using a VPN, that's one I'll, I'll use, but I can use a US-based uh, server, so it never actually leaves the US. Now, and therefore, I'm not, I'm not running afoul of any GDPR type stuff. Um, so, you know, there's, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's the general data protection regulation in, uh, you know, uh, in Europe. Um, so, yeah, there's those same kinds of considerations that you want to, you know, bear in mind. Um, but, you know, stick with the tried and true. And, you know, remember that uh, you get what you pay for. So, you know, um, don't. When you're when you're trying to go cheap here, you're talking about dollars, not tens of dollars or hundreds of dollars. It's just not worth it. You know, spend the extra buck or two to go with the the name brand that other people are using. Yeah, a few bucks to save, you know, you know protect a hundred thousand dollars. You know, it's, yeah. <laughs> um, another question on on a little bit of the layering. Uh, Anthony asked if it's necessary to use encrypted email if you're also using VPN. Yeah, so th those can be kind of separate topics there. So the VPN is making sure that the, the connection between you and whatever you're doing is, is encrypted and secure. So that's good to make sure your connection and all your traffic over that network is encrypted. The encrypted email then is uh, going through that connection and then going out through the internet to some recipient somewhere. So it's actually getting outside of your VPN and going to wherever you know you sent that. And so making sure it's an encrypted email is going to make sure that the contents of that email are encrypted, not only through your connection, through your VPN, but then once it leaves the VPN, it's encrypted. Yeah, you think about it sort of as a physical model. You know, there's, you've got you, you've got the, the network you're attached to, you've got the ISP that's connecting you to the internet, and then there's the service providers, and, the, and then the, you know, and then the other, you know, things on the other end, you know, coming back up that pipeline. You know, the VPN is going to take you through your network connection to the ISP, and that's going to be secured. Uh, and can encrypt it. Uh, but then once it exits that, you know, it's not encrypted anymore automatically. So encrypted email would cause that to be encrypted at, you know, from until it hits the other ISP where the person's getting their email from. Um, so that's the difference there. And then, you know, you also, VPN is not the same thing as a remote desktop, right? So VPN is just about getting connected to the ISP, to the internet. Remote desktop is getting into an environment, you know, like a corporate environment and then operating from inside there. Um, you know, it has a lot of similarities to a VPN, um, but as far as it, you know, in, encrypting that connection, um, but they're for different purposes. Lots of entry points, I guess, but yeah, VPN protecting the horse that's in the barn and encrypted email protecting the animal once it's raced out of the front door. So. Yep. A um, couple more questions, then we'll wrap up. Again, if you, if you do have a question we didn't get to, or if you think of something afterward, reach out to the uh, speakers afterward. Um, looking for your opinion on ACHs uh, uh, for withdrawals, deposits, you know, many lenders, buyers now using this method. So probably not the best way to be uh, handling money involving a real estate transaction. Yeah, did you say ACH? Was that the question? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so a lot of states, you know, have good funds laws that, that prohibit you from using ACH for uh, certain payments there, particularly down payments. and. You know, the other problem or the concern with ACH is that there's a clawback period on it of, I think, up to 60 days. So, you know, if you get a case where somebody's, you know, selling a piece of property, the buyer and seller in on a, a fraudulent scam together, and they, they give you this big ACH deposit, and then you wire money out to the seller, and then they pull the money back from the ACH deposit that they sent there. There are just a lot of problems that can happen with ACH, and that's why the good funds laws exist there, so they know that you know the money is actually good. So I, I would kind of avoid that. You know, sometimes if it's like earnest money or here in Texas option money, there are some options with ACH, but uh, when it comes for closing funds, that can be yeah. dangerous if not illegal. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, and uh, we'll get one more question. This was on passwords. Uh, Scott asked, in, in theory, could we use a password manager to share access to passwords among our small office, similar similar to a family plan? Absolutely, yeah, and that's what that's they designed them for. They, they've got teams, you know, where you can share passwords, and, and it's great for doing that. That way you're not emailing passwords around, you're not writing them down on your desk or something like that. That's an awesome way to use it. And there's ways to do it where you don't even expose the password. You know, that you... Go and click the thing and it'll log them in and they never see the password itself. Oh, 
Fantastic. All right. Well, well, guys, uh, lots of great information. Um, again, one more time, give you give you guys a plug. Yeah. Want want to learn more? Have a question? Please reach out to to either Andy or Chris. Uh, as a reminder, if you did miss parts of the webinar, I think others in the office would benefit from listening. You will get a, a link to the recording uh, in an email tomorrow, and you can always access all the recordings on Alta's website, alta.org forward slash webinars. I do need to take a quick second to post in the chat box the link to uh, submit your CE CLE information if my copy and paste skills want to work. In the meantime, I'll try and multitask here. Um, before wrapping up, I do need to uh, thank Qualia once again for, for sponsoring today's webinar. And uh, there are the link, it's in the chat box. Uh, Andy, Chris, thank you again for uh, taking some time out of your day for sharing uh, some great information on, on cybersecurity. Yep, thank yep, you for thanks, us. Brad. All right, and with that, that will bring us to the conclusion of today's presentation. Uh, take care, everyone. Thanks, everybody.